Friends, we thank you for coming out this evening to hear our Bible-based address this evening to the title, A Message of Hope for Mankind. And our speaker for this evening, my friend and brother, Mr Tim Bailey, has asked that by way of introduction to his remarks that we read from a short portion of scripture from the book of Psalms and Psalm 72. That psalm, friends, is an introduction to our Bible-based address for this evening to the title, A Message of Hope for Mankind. And we'll call forward our speaker for this evening to address us, Mr Tim Bailey. Well, thank you, Mr Chairman, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are now in the dying throes of day 48 of 2019. And so far, what we can say is that 2019 is pretty much exactly the same as the year 2018. Particularly when we talk about political turmoil and unrest, when we talk about extreme weather events, when we talk about financial instability. And the Financial Times has put together a little wrap up of the year 2018. There was politically sanctioned uh, murder, there was political corruption, political tensions, financial greed, trade wars, extreme weather events, just to name a few. You've then got immorality, gun violence and threats of war. This is hardly a world in which man can have hope. And when you wrap up a year like that we have just seen, you realise that in this world there is no hope. And I think you can go without saying that this world is in chaos. It's in crisis. We come across such headlines as we are now living in dangerous times, referring to the Trump administration. We are now living in unprecedented times, talking about the uncharted waters that the UK find themselves in when it comes to Brexit. We have political tensions as the US withdraws from the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty with Russia, stoking fears that we could be heading towards another Cold War. And even closer to home, ladies and gentlemen, we have political turmoil in that we lost yet another Prime Minister only last year. And when we think about that, things have continued on in 2019. You think about headlines such as Russia themselves are preparing for war. That last week, Vladimir Putin announced that he wanted all the country's ISPs to become totally disconnected from the internet. He wanted all of their traffic rerouted through Russia itself, as opposed to going through nodes in foreign countries so that their data packets could not be sniffed. Intelligence services have noticed that Russian activity in submersibles around major junctions of undersea internet cables. The United Kingdom made the com comment that disrupting those cables would have the capability of bringing down the world wide web as we know it today, totally disrupting the world's communications. Very convenient in a situation of war. And so we are seeing words like unprecedented, exceptional, risky, and they're coming up time and time again in the media. Technology has changed everything in our lives. Our new technologies like blockchain, robotics, and artificial intelligence are set to change the world. And they're not set to change the world for better. We know that China is currently developing artificial uh, intelligence robots to go around, go around and make autonomous, autonomous war-like decisions after mounting a machine gun on top of their robots. And so it's not going to help us in the long term. Only in the last few weeks we have seen unprecedented rainfall in Townsville. It was only on Friday last week that the Bureau of Meteorology officially labelled this event as exceptional. And so we're getting all these extreme adjectives 
bubbling up through the media. We had the meth methamphetamine crisis that is currently going on in Australia with WA, the, the methamphetamine capital of the country. West Australians are the biggest ice users in the country, according to the unprecedented analysis. There it is again. Unprecedented analysis that equates to an anonymous drug test of up to 14 million Australians. While the national average of daily meth consumption is about one hit for every 28 people, Perth is about one hit per 17 people a day and one hit per 13 people at one undisclosed country town. Four WA wastewater treatment facilities were monitored, three in the metropolitan area. And the frightening scale of the ice epidemic in Australia is exposed in the 60-page report from the Australian uh, Criminal Intelligence Commission. And so we are living in an age, friends, that is an unprecedented age in many respects. For the people who are affected by the, the ice epidemic, their families, what hope have they got? And so we are living in an unprecedented age on a number of fronts. Technology, medical science, weapons of mass destruction, political turmoil and political instability, financial uncertainty and terrorism. And we're here to talk to you tonight about a message of hope for mankind. But what, does, what hope does a man have in a world such as this? You know, the word hope in the Macquarie Dictionary is defined as the expectation of something desired or a desire accompanied by expectation. It is confidence in a future event. And probably the only future event that we can have any confidence in these days is war. Look at Russia and the Ukraine. Look at the relationship between Russia and the US. The relationship between the US and China. The US and Iran. Israel and all her neighbours. So what hope is man desperately clinging on to? And when you have a look at all the surveys that are done around the country and around the world, the number one hope for people is that they might be happy. More money came in at number four. But the number one hope for people was that they might be happy. And despite the unprecedented leaps and bounds in medicine, Despite the billions of dollars being poured into research to combat cancers and bodily diseases, you know, there wouldn't be one person in this hall tonight who has not benefited from the research that has taken place in the medical field. And yet people still hope to be happy. And what that suggests to us is that despite all the advances in medical science, it is not equating to a general overall increase in man's happiness. And man is relying upon technology to realise that hope of happiness. They are trusting that technology will bring cures to their medical ailments, to the climate change, to the water purity issues in the earth, to food shortages. And so what if it did? Answer that question. What if technology did finally crack the curse of medical ailments? What if it did turn climate change around? Then what? Well, man will continue to live his three score and ten years, maybe four score these days, but he will live out his 70 years and die. And he will return to the dust of the ground never to be heard of again. In fact, man would destroy himself if he didn't die. Jeremiah says it's not within man to direct his own steps, or they think it is. 
At the moment, technology is being hailed as a hero, the answer to all things, but it will not bring the answers we are looking for. Technology will not overcome mortality. It's a false hope. It's the only hope the world can offer, but it's a false hope. We will still all die. And yet there is a hope, friends, that God is offering to every human being upon this earth. And it's in this book, the Bible. But it also happens to be this book that is deliberately overlooked by mankind. This book contains a wonderful hope with a glorious vision of a future that will be characterised by righteousness and peace rather than violence and death. But as a result of man's refusal to listen to God, he has overlooked that very hope which is available to him. He would prefer to do anything else than to read the Bible. You think of NASA. They are spending billions of dollars sending probes way out to the far edges of space known to man to try and discover the birth of our species. So the Bible. It's an incredible book. It's called the Holy Bible or separate book. It is a book that is completely set apart from all other literature. And God's holy word, which he has graciously given to mankind, that we might know how to live a life that is well-pleasing to Almighty God. And this book cannot be added to or taken away. Come with me to Revelation chapter 22 for a moment. We find a stark warning. We see in Revelation chapter 22, we read there in verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And this book was written over the course of 1,500 years by approximately 40 different people. But when you look at this book, you can see the harmony that exists between all of the books in the Bible and you cannot help but come to the conclusion or the realisation that this book was masterminded by a greater being than man himself. And so God wrote the Bible. And we find in 2nd of Peter chapter 1 and at verse 21 it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. This was not man's idea. This was God. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is God's words, friends. And we need to sit up and take notice of the hope as it is set before us in this incredible book. So what is this hope? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us what this hope is, and if you would come with me to the epistle he wrote to the Colossians. In the epistle that he wrote to the Colossians, to the members of the church, or more correctly, the Ecclesia of Colossae, he says in Colossians chapter 1 and at verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and to Motheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which he had to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And so there's the hope. Paul tells us that the hope is contained in the truth of the gospel. So what's the gospel? 
Well, the Bible, when it was written, it was written in three languages. The Old Testament was made up of Hebrew and Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek. And the word, and the word gospel in Greek simply means good message. You've got EU, an adverb of quality signifying good, and angelion, a message. A message delivered in the name of anyone. And so the Greek word euangelion simply means good message. And the person receiving that message is receiving good news. And so what we find, ladies and gentlemen, is the gospel is referred to as the truth of the gospel. But Paul refers to it slightly differently when he wrote to the Ecclesia of Rome. Come with me to Romans. In Romans chapter 1, if you would turn there for a moment. Because in this passage, the Apostle Paul is introducing himself to the members of the Roman Ecclesia. And we read there in the first verse of Romans chapter 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And so here the Apostle Paul is referring to the gospel as the gospel of God. He is speaking of the gospel. He is speaking of the same thing, the good message or good news. And on this occasion, it is emanating from God. So Paul was separated unto the gospel of God. We see that in the first verse. In order that he might preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Now a Gentile is anyone who is not a Jew. We see that in Acts chapter 28, if you would turn there for a moment. Acts 28 is recording for us what the Apostle Paul did after he was separated unto the gospel of God. And so in Acts chapter 28, we see in verse 30 where we read, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all them that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And so here the message that Paul was preaching was that of the kingdom of God and those things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the gospel. That is what he was preaching. And he was preaching to anyone that came and visited him in his own rented house. So the things concerning the kingdom of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's speaking of a time when God will set up his glorious kingdom in the earth and it will be ruled over by his son, even the Lord Jesus Christ, in righteousness. It is a vis vision of the future that will have a political system that is just, that is fair, that is righteous. Completely different contrast to the political systems that currently exist in the world today. And I'd like you to now turn with me to Psalm 72, the, the reading which we had read for us this evening. Because in Psalm 72, we are given a glimpse of this glorious age that is to dawn upon the face of this earth. We find there a beautiful characterization of the glorious time soon to come. We read there in verse 1 of Psalm 72. It says, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. And so what we are being told, friends, is that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be the king of this glorious kingdom. 
and he is going to judge the people with righteousness. And we find in verse 3, the mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills. They are varying powers of authority and they're going to meet out fair judgment to the constituents of that day. Verse 7, in his day shall the righteous flourish an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. It's going to be a glorious time. There is nowhere in this world currently where there is true peace. Look at verse 11. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. That's why there's going to be peace. Because all of mankind is going to be ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ instead of trying to rule themselves. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 gives us a few more details of this kingdom age. We find in Isaiah chapter 11, and at verse 5, it says, And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And so that's just saying in another way what Psalm 72 says, right? And so then in verse 6, it says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know, in this time to come, ladies and gentlemen, things are going to be done right. And as a result of that, peace will endure throughout the whole earth. It is speaking of a time when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. That is a reference back to Habakkuk chapter 2 and at verse 14. It's speaking of the time when, when the kingdom in the earth has been established, it will be full of people who are manifesting the glory of God. Or in other words, are manifesting the characteristics of God. It's in Numbers chapter 14 and at verse 21, if you would turn there for a moment. Truly I live all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And so here, ladies and gentlemen, God is swearing by himself because he can swear by no greater. All the earth will be filled with people who think like God, people who act like God, people who are merciful like God, people who are empathetic like God, people who are endeavouring to live as God would live. So coming back to the gospel in its different manifestations, we find that the gospel is also styled the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 4. I'd like you to turn there with me for a moment, please. Because in Matthew chapter 4, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy and he healed them. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ went about preaching the gospel, sometimes he used the term the gospel of the kingdom. 
Sometimes he used the term the kingdom or just the gospel on its own. And we haven't listed all the um, terms that are used to refer to the gospel on that list by any means. But all the terms that the Lord Jesus Christ uses and that Paul uses and that Peter and John use, it's all talking about the same thing. The gospel of God concerning the kingdom of God and the things concerning his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Just come with me now to Acts chapter 10. Because in Acts chapter 10, the Apostle Peter is talking to a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. In Acts chapter 10, we find there in verses 35 and 36, we read these words. Well, let's go to verse 34 for context. And then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. And so we find that Peter was picking up on the gospel that was being preached back in Matthew chapter 4. And it's talking about the good news or the word that was sent and there's our idea of the message, that good message, that good news concerning the kingdom of God. And it was sent to the nation of Israel through the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of the kingdom, the message. The Lord Jesus Christ, the messenger. And so it's all about a messenger, warning of the day of Yahweh, the day that God will set up the kingdom in the earth when the Lord Jesus Christ is to return to this earth to set up that kingdom. And so here was a messenger sending a message. Some good news about a kingdom to Israel which they didn't yet possess. And so that changes it, doesn't it? It changes that promise into a hope. So here was the Lord Jesus Christ preaching the kingdom of God to Israel as a hope. And so the kingdom of God, the gospel, the gospel concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope of Israel are all the same thing. It was the same thing that God preached to Abraham as a matter of promise back in Genesis chapter 12. And you know, it says of Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11, if you would turn there with me for a moment. Hebrews chapter 11 is the honour roll of the faithful. Men and women who were extremely faithful and they have been noted in Hebrews chapter 11 and the reason as to why they were faithful. And so we find in Hebrews chapter 11 and at verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, that's the promise back in Genesis chapter 12, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. And by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Notice what it then says in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That was their hope, ladies and gentlemen. 
to be resurrected to life again, to receive immortality and to be in the kingdom of God in the land to which God had promised him, the land of Israel, the land where the kingdom of God or the capital, Jerusalem, is going to be. But that's not just Abraham's hope, ladies and gentlemen. It's also our hope. That hope can be ours if we are baptised into the all-saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 3 and at verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ, and if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so that hope that Abraham had, friends, can be our hope. If we believe the gospel as Abraham believed it. But that's not the only thing that we have to do. There are three steps to a valid baptism. If you come with me to Mark chapter 16 and at verse 16. Because there we are told in verse 16 or verse 15, And the Lord Jesus Christ said unto them, Go you into all the world, that is the apostles, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. And so there are three steps that we need to complete to have a valid baptism. The first is belief. We need to believe the gospel that Abraham received. We then need to be baptised into the all-saving name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we need to adhere to the gospel, to adhere to the principles that God has contained in his word. It was not just Abraham's hope, ladies and gentlemen, and it's not just our hope, either. I'd like you to come with me to Romans chapter 8. And again, we're going to listen to the Apostle Paul. We're going to look at verse 24 of Romans chapter 8, where it says, for we are saved by hope. That's the same hope that Abraham had. It's the hope that the Apostle Paul has. And if you look at the, the Greek, it is, it is uh, to be exact, for we are saved by the hope. There is only one way that we can obtain salvation, and it's through this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. See, we need to have faith. We need to be able to see through our mind's eye, through faith, that God is going to carry out his promise. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? And so then we find that this gospel is referred to as the hope, as it is here in verse 24. So ladies and gentlemen, that is how this hope that was Paul's, that was Abraham's, can be our own. A hope that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, we may be ready and accepted into his glorious kingdom, soon to be set up upon the earth. You see, God is offering mankind the hope of eternal life. The only thing that the earth, that the world can offer us is eternal death. Man will live out the days that are allotted to him and he will die. He is here for a short time and like a flower he fadeth away. But we, ladies and gentlemen, now have the opportunity to make the change in our life and be baptised that we too may be able 
to share that hope. And I want to leave you with one final quote in Ephesians chapter 2, which says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh prior to our baptism, that at that time we were without Christ, we weren't baptised into his name, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we leave it up to you to help yourselves and to obtain that glorious hope that is contained in the Bible that God has offered each and every one of us.